Go back to Nehemiah. We're going to continue. Brother Matt started a new series this morning. Before we do that, uh, let me make a little announcement. This Saturday, September 26th, there's going to be a big prayer march in Washington, D.C. Franklin Graham is leading one. Jonathan Kahn is leading another. Uh, separately, they felt the call to do this. And 40 days before the election, this will be taking place to, to pray for America, to uh, repent of our national sins, some of the things Matt talked about this morning, to pray for healing of America, to pray for our police, military, for our families, for our president and leaders, praying for national reconciliation, religious freedom, and uh, some of the churches in the area, because not all of us can go to Washington, D.C., some of the churches are going to be meeting to have prayer as church families. So I'm just going to announce, I'm going to be here at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. And if any of you would like to come up and uh, pray with me for our country, uh, please do. Uh, men and women, young people, everybody. If you'd like to come and pray for our country, uh, I'll be here. And I think it would be a good thing to do. Our, our country needs praying for. Brother Matt brought that out this morning when he looked at Nehemiah's prayer. And that's the kind of prayer we need to be praying for America. As Brother Matt said this morning, Nehemiah had learned of the sad conditions in Jerusalem. He told us the people were beaten down. The walls were broken down. The gates were burnt down. All this caused him to weep and pray. And he felt God's calling upon him to return to Jerusalem and lead out in a rebuilding of the walls and gates of the city. For four months he prayed and waited. Four vivid verbs tell us the heart of Nehemiah. He said he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And finally his opportunity came. So in chapter 2, Let's begin reading with number, or verse number 1. And we're going to talk about Nehemiah's building plans as he gets the opportunity to return and lead out in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2.1 And it came to pass in a month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lies in a waste, the gates thereof are consumed with fire. And the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, praying for guidance here. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that you would send me unto Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? When wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of God upon me. And I came to the governors beyond the river, gave the king's letters. The king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. I had an armed escort going back with him. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. To stop there, 
And first of all, if you want to take notes, let's think about the great promises to builders. Nehemiah received three promises from the king of Persia. We also have these promises from our king, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we, as you look at these promises, then we're going to consider several principles that uh, should be involved in any building that we might be doing. When we think about building tonight, uh, we think about building our church. We can think about building our life on a sure foundation, building our families, building our country. I think these principles were, would per, were, pertain to all of those. So let's think about this. Nehemiah's building plans and the great promises to builders. First of all, we had the king's permission. Nehemiah had the king's permission to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls and the gates. But more important than that, he realized that he had God's permission. God answered his prayers by putting it into the heart of the king to grant his request. Now, the king had noticed Nehemiah was sad. And it said that Nehemiah was sore afraid. I guess being a, a wet blanket at the king's party was uh, kind of dangerous. You wanted to look happy and cheerful around the king. So he was afraid of that. And, and he was afraid of how the king might respond to his request. Now you think about that. Many Christians today seem to be afraid to openly serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what other people may think or what other people might say. And if fear is not a problem, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions here. Before we start building anything, ask, number one, ask, is the work right? Is what I'm wanting to do pleasing unto God? Is this God's will for me to do this? See, we need to be sure that what we want to do is scripturally right. It's what God wants, not just what we want. So question number one, is the work right? Second, question number two, am I right? Am I right with God? Am I a fit vessel for God to use? We see that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, where it says, if a man purge himself from these, these sins that can come upon us, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. So it may be a good work, and maybe something God wants done, but are we right before God? In other words, is there something in my life that I need to deal with before God can use me, before I can be a fit vessel? We had the king's permission. Secondly, we had the king's protection. Nehemiah received letters from the king to give him safe passage back to Judea. He's going to have to go through several uh, countries and provinces that may have been enemies to Israel in the past. And he needs these letters that he might have safe pa passage back to Judea. Letters from the king of that empire. Hey, do we have kings or do we have letters from our king? What's this? We have letters of authority from King Jesus that gives us the authority to do the work that he has given to us. See, we have a great commission which authorizes us to go into all the world making disciples, and planting new churches. Sometimes people ask us, by what authority do you do that? We've got the authority of God's Word. Amen. And Nehemiah had an armed escort. Has God given us a, an escort, a, a host to protect us? If you've been coming on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about that. We've been talking about the angels of God. And these angels are there to protect us. I mentioned to my class, Elisha. 
at one time here. They're in Jerusalem and they were surrounded by the Assyrian army. And his servant was so afraid of this great army that surrounded them. And Elisha said, God, open his eyes and let him see. And the servant looked and there was another great army surrounding the Assyrian army. There was the host of heaven. Invisible to the eyes of many. But God allowed the servant to see. Open his eyes. In Hebrews 1.14. It says, are they talking about angels? Are they not all ministering spirits? Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So we got, go, go to Psalm 91. This is kind of the passage I've been using on Wednesday night. But in Psalm 91, look at verses 9 through 12. Here it says, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So we've been talking about angels and guardian angels and those angels of God that are sent to minister unto us and protect us from harm. So God has given us that protection. Then thirdly, we have the king's provisions. We've got his permission. We've got his protection. We have his provisions. Because the king gave Nehemiah the material he needed. All the material he's going to need to go back and rebuild the walls and, and make new gates and all the things that were going to be need to be rebuilt. He's able to go into the king's forest and receive all the lumber that he's going to need. Well, let me say this, does not the Lord equip us? Does he not enable us to do the work that he's given to us? Now, we've been commissioned to do the work, but we've also been enabled to accomplish that work. This is what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, what's the rest of it? Who strengtheneth me. Philippians 4, 19, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. According to his riches. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, doesn't he? So we have all of the provision that we need to perform the work that's been given to us. Jesus promised us in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. So we've got the provisions we need. Everything we need, God is going to provide for us if we're willing to do the work that's been set before us. Now let me give you some guiding principles in building that we see in this story. First of all, we see in verse 12, we must fix our focus. I think I stopped with verse 10. Look at verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. So Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem. He quietly begins to survey what needs to be done. He does not publicly proclaim his purpose for returning. He's, he's not like those who do a lot of talking about what needs to be done and yet they really don't ever do anything. Now, God has a purpose. God has a plan for all of us. I, I believe that. There's something God wants each of us to do. We need to find out if our plans are in agreement with God's plans. Amen? Amen? I think too many people are just wandering aimlessly like a, like a ship without a sail, without a compass, just running in neutral and getting nowhere. Do you have any God-given goals? Hey, we're to honor the Lord in everything we do. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do through each and every one of us. 
Fix your focus on something that you can do for the Lord. Something that he may put on your heart to do for his cause. Fix our focus. Secondly, we must find the facts. Verses 13 through 15. He said, I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. And I went out to the gate of the fountain to the king's pool, there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass because of all the clutter. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. So here's Nehemiah. He's inspecting the city, looking to see what needs to be done. He wants to see what the real condition is. He's not like an ostrich with his head stuck in the sand. He wants to see the truth. I think there's a lot of people today that they don't want to see the truth. They don't want to know what's really going on around them. We need to find the facts, don't we? Have you ever surveyed the needs of your church? What needs to be done here? Are there areas of ministry in the church that you could help in? Are there needs that most don't even know about. Many seem to, they, they see some things that need to be done, and yet they want others to do it. There were many in Jerusalem. When Nehemiah came back, they saw the ruins. They saw the broken down walls, the burnt gates. They could see it. And yet they were not motivated to do anything about it. Not until Nehemiah came back and started challenging them to do the work. Brother Matt mentioned this morning, these broken down walls, we've got some broken down walls in America. We've got some walls of decency that are broken down. Walls of freedom. Walls of homes that are broken. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about these rebuilding these walls of America? Number three, we must form a fellowship. Look at verse 16 and 17. It says, And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies in waste. All the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Now, he is getting others involved. He knows he cannot do this alone. He does not believe in a one-man ministry. So he starts recruiting others to join him in the great work that's before them. He formed a fellowship. Well, is that what we've done here? At Florence Street Baptist Church, have we not formed a fellowship to do the work that needs to be done? Jesus established a church to carry out this work. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are laborers together with God. How powerful it is when we all can work together in unity. Now, when you joined this church, you entered into a church covenant, didn't you? You ever read the church covenant? When people join, I I send them a card with the church covenant. I want them to see what they're getting involved in. We all have agreed together as a church to work for Christ, to carry out his great commission, to further the cause of this church. And I, I believe everybody that joins has good intentions. I really do. They want to join. They want to be a part. They want to do something. And yet many, before long, they just kind of fall by the wayside. They never really get plugged in. Now, maybe that's our fault. Maybe we need to do a better job of getting people plugged in. But many do fall by the wayside and never really become a faithful member of the church. We need to remember. 
Now, there's none of you that we don't need. We need you to be involved in the work. You remember the lesson of the Canadian geese, don't you? How they fly in a V formation. They say that they can fly 72% further in V formation than one goose flying by himself. You ever notice that V formation, usually one leg is longer than the other. You know why that is? There's more geese in that one. Think about it. They say that the lead goose, after a while, falls back to the back, and the next one comes up to take the lead. Because the lead goose has taken on the most resistance, while the others get the draft. So they know every once in a while for him to drop back and another take his place. Now, if a silly goose can do that, why can't we? Amen. We need to fly in the formation here. We need to all be involved and help one another and uh, take the lead sometimes in some projects. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that's kind of interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30. So one shall chase a thousand, two shall chase ten thousand. You get a helper, you can do a lot more, can't you? Together we build. Say that with me. Together we build. Now come on, put put some heart into it. Ready? Together we build. Amen. Together. We need to be unified in this and have a, some motivation to build this church up to be what it ought to be. I read Henry Ford, who was a master at organization, said this once. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is a process. Thinking together is unity. And working together is success. He was very successful, wasn't he? He believed in teamwork. You know, the Bible says no man liveth unto himself. Well, we can say that we shouldn't try to work by ourselves either. Let's get involved in something and help others in the cause that's before us. Form a fellowship. We've already done that. Get involved in the fellowship. Get involved in the ministry. Then number four, we must fortify the faith. Look at verse 18. It said, Then I told them of the good hand of my God which was upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. There's the theme of the whole series. Let us rise up and build. You ought to highlight that or underline that in your Bible. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. After he had rehearsed to them what God had done in providing the the provisions, the protection that they needed, wanting them to know that God was leading in this work, that this was not just all Nehemiah's idea, God was behind all this. We need to see that. That this is the Lord's work. I I like that uh, verse in Psalm 126, 3, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we're glad. Is that not true? The Lord has done great things for us. We ought to be able to say amen to that. But we need leaders in our church. Men like Nehemiah who can fortify the faith of the people. Paul wrote it in Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Have you provoked anybody lately? There's time to do that, isn't there? The idea is we need to encourage one another. Encourage one another for the good work that is before us. And hopefully when we do this, and and the outcome of this series will be what we see here in verse 18, so they strengthen their hands for the good work. That's what we want to see happen here. Everybody be encouraged and motivated and willing to get involved 
in helping us build this church. You know, we're, after COVID, we're, we're kind of rebuilding, aren't we? We're, we had a good turnout today. Uh, I think this is the, the, the biggest attendance we've had since March when all this started. And uh, hopefully we're building back. But uh, there's a lot to be done. And we need everybody involved in building the church up to what it should be. You take a church that's activated by the Spirit of God, saturated by the Word of God, and dedicated to the Son of God, then God's going to say, I'm going to give that church an open door. Amen? We need an open door, don't we? 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul wrote, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. That brings us to our fifth point. We've got to face the foe. We must face the foe. Let's go back to Nehemiah, look at verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, Geshem the Arabian heard what Nehemiah was wanting to do, they laughed us to scorn. And despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Now every time God's people say, let us rise up and build, the hosts of hell are going to rise up and say, let's stop them. They're going to do everything they can to stop us from doing the good work. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. If this is God's work, then it's going to succeed. No matter what the devil may throw at us. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's never easy to serve the Lord. But it's worth it. It pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. There's no place in the kingdom work of God for the lazy or the selfish. It, it, no, it's not a picnic doing this. It's a conflict. We've got an enemy that we must contend with. We've got to contend with the forces of darkness. There are many who will come against us. There will be many of our own people who will fail to show up to help us. But we can't quit. Amen? We can't quit. We've got to continue on. You know, I would hate to pastor a church that the devil's not worried about. Amen. That one he doesn't have to oppose because it's not doing anything. Folks, any growing church is going to face satanic opposition. But don't worry about it. Because the devil's already been defeated. Don't worry about criticism. Nehemiah's going to face a lot of criticism here. But don't worry about that. Somebody said the only way to escape criticism is to say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Well, that's not true. They'll criticize you for that too. <laughs> you can't get away from it. Whether you do something or not, you're going to get criticized. Now, I'd rather be criticized for trying to do something than to be criticized for doing nothing. There's a lot of sand ballots out there, a lot of Tobias who are going to try to hinder the work. We've got churches right now that are told that they cannot meet and they're going to meet anyway especially out in California there's one Baptist church out there is being fined a thousand dollars a day they're still meeting John MacArthur's bunch is still meeting packed house he said well if they send me to jail I guess I'll start a jail ministry that's one ministry I've never done. So maybe the Lord wants me to do a jail ministry before my time's up. That's all right with me. We need to pray for those people, by the way. That they're willing to take that kind of a stand. And it, we may face the same thing before it's all over. Ephesians 6, 10, 11. We, we, we quote this a lot. But it seems like it so, so much pertains to our day and time. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We've got to stand. But God's equipped us so that we can stand. 
And then finally, we must fulfill the function. I think I read verse 20, Nehemiah's answer. He said, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. Now, chapter 3 looks like a Hebrew telephone directory. All these names of the people involved in the work. Let me just read the first five verses and point something out here in conclusion. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Elisha, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it, set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. Next unto him built the men of Jericho. Next to them built Zechariah, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Heshaniah build, who also laid the beams thereof, set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, son of Kaz. Next to them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel. Unto him repaired Zadok, the son of Baana. Next to them the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. I wanted to get to them before I stop. As you look at this, you see how to fulfill the function that's before us. Three thoughts here in closing. First note the pattern, how they did it. They were organized. They didn't just go off, do their own thing. Leaders were selected, and the work was divided among the people. They were willing to follow God's man and willing to do what he directed them to do. So each one found his place of service, and he went to work. Now, you cannot do everything, but you can do something. Amen? Some people say that they're against organized religion. Does that mean they prefer unorganized religion? They want chaos? What do they want? I kind of like organization myself. We need to get organized to get the work done. So there's the pattern how they did it. Then note the people who did it. Everyone had a part in the work. The old, the young, the men, the women, the rich, the poor, the urbanites, the suburbanites. Everybody went to work. Until you get down to verse 5, the nobles of Tekoa refused to work. It's like every church has their nobility that uh, thinks it's just beneath them to have to get involved in some things. Here's what I want you to see here. This whole chapter is a record of those who went to work as well as those who refuse to go to work. Thousands of years later, here we have it right here, those names. How many millions of people have read this chapter and read those names of these people that went to work, but also read of these nobles of Tekoa that refused to go to work? Now, here's my point. God's still keeping a record. There's a record in heaven of those who go to work and those who refuse to go to work. It's been written down. And one day we're going to stand before the Lord and give an account why we didn't go to work, why we made excuses, why we turned down requests to get involved in the Lord's work. It's coming a judgment day. Every one of us are going to give an account for what we've done with our life. Folks, th these are days of opportunity. Amen? If you're going to do anything for Christ, you better get busy. Because time's running out. We don't have much time left. I'm still waiting for that last trump to sound.
Rosh Hashanah is not over yet. I told Betty, I said, wouldn't it be fitting for the Lord to come on a Sunday night when most ch church members are skipping services? A lot of churches are not even meeting on Sunday nights anymore. I think it'd just be fitting for the Lord to come on Sunday night. Wednesday night would even be better, wouldn't it? Well, I'm glad you're here. The trumpet sounds, we all get to go together. These are days of opportunity. The Bible says in Judges 5.23, Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants of Meraz, because they came not to the help of the Lord. In Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, they were about to go into the promised land to take possession of that land. Two tribes have claimed land on the other side of the Jordan River. They said, we'll just take this land. You guys go on in there and, and whip the Canaanites and take that land. Moses said, no, you're going with us. Your brethren helped you to occupy this land. You're going to go over it and help us possess the rest of the land. Now look what he says here, though. If you will not do so, if you will not go over and help us, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. Now you've heard that verse, haven't you? Be sure your sin will find you out. You ever wonder, what sin is that talking about? It's talking about the sin of doing nothing. <laughs> the sin of doing nothing. Of sitting down and letting others go fight the battles. Let others do all the work. The Bible says that's a sin that will find you out one day. Jesus said in Luke 12, 47, in a parable, that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. That sin of doing nothing is going to cause that. He said, Brother West, what does that mean, be beaten with many stripes? I don't know, but it doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> I don't want that for me. I don't want it for you. I don't want to see you getting beaten with many stripes because you did nothing. Come on. Whatever it is, we want to avoid that, don't we? I'd rather receive the crown and a commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I, I want to hear that for you. As your pastor, I want to sit there swelled up with pride to hear the Lord saying to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And many of you will hear that. Then there's the places. We've noticed how they did it, who did it, and note where they did it. As you read through this, each person started in his own area, near his own house. Now, where do we need to go to work? Well, we could probably start in our own home with our own family. Then in our old neighborhood, reach out to our neighbors. How about you young people starting off at school in your classroom with your classmates or with your teammates? You're on a team? How about with your coworkers? We can start by being faithful in the places where God has put us. Being faithful to the church that you belong to. See, when you don't come and get involved, there's a gap in that place where you should be. And somebody else is going to have to make up for your absence. Somebody else is going to have to double up to make up for you not being here. Paul said in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren and sistren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now what we're talking about is your reasonable service. You might be thinking, oh, this is unreasonable. 
You're expecting too much. No, the Bible says it's reasonable to serve the Lord. It's just reasonable for each of us to find our place and be faithful. Just think what it would be like if every member of this church would find a place of service and be faithful. There's three groups identified in this story. There's a group that says, let us rise up and build. That's one. There's a group that criticizes and hinders those that want to build. Then there's those who refuse to help out. Which group do you belong to? Are you involved in building? Are you trying to hinder the work? Are you excusing yourself from being involved? Let's rise up and build. We're in a rebuilding phase. Sunday school teachers, I want to challenge you tonight. Rise up and build your class back up. Come on, Sunday school teacher. Can I get an amen out of one of you? Rise up and rebuild your class. Our, te- our Sunday school attendance is just about bottomed up. Are we, are we happy, satisfied with that? Let's rise up and build a great youth group. Let's rise up and build a great bus ministry. Let's rise up and build a great choir and orchestra. There's much to be done. Let's rise up and build a great outreach ministry. Can we count on you to help out? Now, we cannot build without a foundation, and the foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know the Lord, you need to start by coming to Him in faith and putting your faith and trust in Him. Give your life and your soul to the Lord Jesus tonight. Make Him the foundation to build upon. Because Jesus said, He that's not with me, is what? Is against me. He that's not with me is against me. So if you need to make a choice tonight, we pray that you'll make the right choice. Identify the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a stand for Him and for His great cause.